Another topic to discuss in the management of prostate cancer is what to do if you've had a radical prostatectomy and the PSA begins to rise. Well, first of all, the question is when does it start to rise? Because studies have shown that patients whose PSA begins to rise many years after they've had the surgery probably have less risk than men whose PSA begins to rise within the first three years of undergoing the operation. So the key question is, when does it start to rise? And the second question is, how fast is it rising? One of the things that we look at is something called the doubling time, the PSA doubling time. In other words, how long does it take for a PSA to double in value from one to two or two to four or something else like that? Because we've learned that patients whose PSA doubles quickly have a greater risk than patients whose PSA doubles slowly. Well, what is quickly? If your PSA is doubling in three months or less, that's considered a rapidly doubling PSA. On the other hand, if it's taking nine months, 12 months, 15 months for your PSA to double, that probably represents a low risk factor for getting into trouble. A key point to emphasize here is that just because the PSA is rising after surgery does not mean that a patient will be in trouble and it does not mean that all men need to be treated. So two of the factors that are key are when does it to occur, when is it going to begin to rise, how fast is it going up. And a third factor is what was the Gleason score on your original surgery specimen? Was it a Gleason score of 7 or less or was it a Gleason score of 8, 9 or 10? because studies have said or shown that those men that have the lower Gleason scores have less risk from their cancer, from the rising PSA, than men whose, whose Gleason score is higher. So the three key factors are when does it occur, how fast is it rising, and what was the Gleason score. And we can begin to break up uh, patients into different groups based on their risk of getting into trouble. And depending on how high that risk is, it may determine whether or not you should undergo some form of treatment. Now, when the PSA begins to rise, one of the questions we want to know is where is it located? Could it be around where the prostate was located in the prostate bed? Or could it be in other parts of the body? If the cancer is in the area around the prostate, some doctors will recommend radiation treatments, radiation to that area to try and kill those cells. On the other hand, if we know the cancer cells are not there, radiation isn't going to make much of a difference. And there are different tests that are available. We can do a bone scan, looking to see if it's in the bones. We can do a CAT scan or an MRI to see if it's in other organs surrounding the prostate or other parts of the body. And one of the tests that is being used is something called a prostacin scan. A prostacin scan injects some radioactive material into your body, not a, not a very significant amount, it's not dangerous to you, but it's able to find cancer cells, prostate cancer cells, and light them up so that when you have a certain type of uh, procedure, x-ray procedure, then it's possible to determine if there are areas in your body where the cancer cells may be located. Now, there's considerable debate about each of these tests. The debate centers around when should you do it and how reliable are the results. The problem with the bone scan and the CAT scan is you need a lot of cancer cells in order for some of them to show up on one of those tests. So generally, around the United States, it's felt that doing a bone scan or a CAT scan when the PSA is less than 10 nanograms is probably not worthwhile. I mean, some doctors will do it, but the fact remains that the odds of finding something are so low that it probably doesn't pay to do it before the PSA reaches those values. And then if it reaches those values and you have a test and the test is still negative, well, you have to continue to be followed 
and maybe get a test in the future. The process in SCAN is another story. There have been some newer results suggesting that it might be a useful test for identifying where cancer is located. But the controversy that remains is, if we find it, should we give you radiation or not? Because so far, the results with radiation don't clearly show that men live longer if you give radiation when there's prostate cancers in the prostate bed. What it does do is it lowers the PSA in many of those cases, and not all of them will get a rise in the PSA again in the future. So it is an option, and for those men that want to be aggressive, it is an aggressive option. You're saying, let's do whatever we can to wherever the cancer is located. Now, another option beside radiation is to give some form of hormone therapy because hormone therapy can kill cells anywhere in the body. And so that is another option. But it has long-term risks as well as long-term benefits. And so before you begin it, you need to understand that, that hormone therapy can have this downside. It can cause hot flashes. It can cause a decreased sex drive. Uh, it can also weaken your bones as it's used for many years. There's a chance that it can affect diabetes. And there's even some question whether it can have an impact on your heart function. So these issues are coming to surface more and more, meaning that there's a pro and a con side to undergoing hormone therapy. In response to that, people are considering what's called intermittent hormone therapy, which means you go on it for a while, suppress your male sex hormone, drop the PSA down, kill a lot of cells, and then you get a rest period where you stop getting the hormone therapy, allow things to return to normal, allow the side effects to disappear, and then when the PSA starts to come up again, you restart the hormone therapy. And in my own experience, I've had patients doing that for 16 or 18 years, where they had a rising PSA, and this kept things in control. Now, how good is intermittent therapy? At the present time, it isn't clear whether intermittent th therapy will prolong survival compared to any other options. Studies are underway, both in the United States and in Europe, trying to answer this very important question. But for now, since we don't have a clear answer, you as a patient faced with this problem have to weigh the pros and cons. So if you have a cancer that's in the low risk category, as I've described before, it's not clear that you need to be very aggressive and start your treatment very early, especially if none of the tests are showing any evidence of cancer. On the other hand, if you have an aggressive behaving cancer, at, that's recurring after the surgery, and you want to do whatever you can to minimize your chances of dying, then you might consider radiation or hormone therapy under these various circumstances. Just be aware that there are trade-offs to those treatments, and there are no studies proving that you're going to live longer. You're basically doing it in the hopes that it's going to help while we wait for other studies to come along. So hopefully that information will be useful and understand that not all men with a rising PSA are going to be in trouble, that there's low risk, there's higher risk groups. Hopefully you're in the lower risk group, but if not, there are other things that you can follow and consider as options. Thank you.